Welcome back to Phoenix Forge. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, a couple of weeks ago, one of you guys asked me, what do you need to consider when you're making a gate? And in all fairness, I've made a few gates. So uh, I thought rather than just yabber at you about gates, I'd show you a few and we can go from there. So let's go out to the garden, which is outside the workshop. Whoa. Dodge past the gate through all the doors. So there's a few gates floating around this workshop. Um, I've got a sort of a display garden, although the building that was the backdrop for it sort of fell down. So we've got to build that back again. Um, but you know, even on your cut and shut gates, like those ones, or some very nice forge ones. So there's a forge one in the back there. And there's a fabricated one behind that. There's a very traditional gate like this one. These are the old cemetery gates off the local town. They were here when we moved in. Uh, gates, gates, gates. You got your driveway gates. You've got your garden gates. And more gates, more gates, more railings. Lots and lots of gates. Now this, this is the first gate that I ever made. And this is, will be the first gate a lot of blacksmiths will have made. Because this is actually the Hereford College gate. Uh, and I made this as a student on my second year. I think it was my second year of college. We made this one. And there's lots of traditional techniques. So, when it on a gate, the things you want to be considering are function. You know, the main function of the gate is obviously uh, controlling access uh, for people. You know, preventing things like your, your dogs and cats from getting out on main roads and stuff like that. And there's a few features in this gate, which will show that quite nicely. So you've got your main uprights, you've got your decorative infill at the top. Uh, on your lower half, you've got the intermittent bars, which are, which are these skinny ones, and they're called your dog bars, and they're in there exactly to keep your dog out. This gate over here shows that again. You know, you've got your top section, your mid bar, and then lower down, you've split the difference with your dog bars, uh, which is quite handy. Obviously, you've got latches and catches and hinges and all those useful things that actually make a gate function and work. Um, on the back style here, so if I go down to the back style, uh, this gate has a uh, journal, which is a very traditional way of hanging gates. That's how I do most of mine. And then on the bottom, you've got a pin which goes into a socket. Now, it's not very clear to see on this steel frame. Most of my gates out here are mounted on steel frames because we've taken to shows uh, and bits and pieces from time to time when we're not in COVID lockdowns. Oh, get back up. Um, and different latches and things. Right, so what else do we need? <clears throat> now, one of the main functions of a gate is obviously we need it to hold its shape. Uh, and for that, we need to factor in things like triangulation. On a small garden gate like these ones, it's not too much of an issue. But if you're doing something that's a lot bigger, then triangulation becomes a big problem. That row of circles on this particular gate, they help with that. You know, they're pinned in four places and they prevent the gate actually twisting diagonally uh, and sagging uh, towards the center. I did a set of bronze gates many years ago when I was working up in Hereford um, for a client. Uh, and it wasn't my forge, I was working for somebody else at the time. And the gates themselves had been designed by an architect who didn't know much about gate design. And they were about a ton of leaf, but there was absolutely zero triangulation in the whole thing. And as a result, they sagged in the middle and clashed. And we had to fit wheels, much to the uh, amusement of the electricians that were on site that were supposed to be doing the automation system for us. So. What else have we got? Obviously, you've got your artistic side of gates as well. You know, most customers don't want something that's just plain and boring anymore. Well, some of them do because they're more worried about price than anything else. Um, but you know, you can you can have any design really when it comes to your gates. Anything from Art Nouveau, Art Deco, uh, to more contemporary stuff, um, and all the rest of it. Right, let's go have a look at another gate. Now you've got your very simple farm gates. Probably the, the, the original gate. There's, there's probably some traditional ones on the farm somewhere. If I went floating around in the hedgerows, I'd find a couple of traditional gates busy rotting into nothing. But they all work on the same principle. You know, you've got two hinges typically, sometimes three or more, depending on the size of the gate. Then you've got a latch. Hello, cows. Nearly dinner time at the zoo. And if I go all the way out this way and I don't fall down the cattle grid, I can show you something a bit more exciting. So this is an estate gate. These ones are actually automated. So there's a ground box down here that holds the automation system. Uh, and then with the click of a button, they open and close. Or they would if the Sparky turned up and did the electrics. Um, at the top here, I've got an adjustable arm that sticks out and holds the gate on the journal. 
and then down there the automation system this is quite a clean automation system this one so it's quite a small uh, mechanical box and then all you've got at the top is that small arm that sticks out maybe about a foot and holds the gate there um, that's all got things like greased stainless bearings and bits and pieces in there so it does quite a nice job um, now these are nicely triangulated this is a good gate showing you that triangulation you know these diagonal crossbars prevent this gate from sagging this gate is about four meters wide so it's fair old size this gate and without those uh, diagonal braces it would just drag on the floor uh, and wouldn't function so it's important to have those in there the scrolls also help with that with the triangulation as you can see they come up they may be artistic but there's a rivet just here and that's helping to brace that corner and prevent it from dropping as well so uh, you know all that scroll work you see on all the old gates does serve a function and there's another gate up here somewhere now that gate obviously is a automated system so it doesn't have um, latches and catches on it because that's all controlled electronically uh, this is another gate I did a few years ago a bit of traditional scroll work up the top some twisted finials nice bit of repousse on this one we do enjoy a bit of repousse from time to time could do with a, a wild brush you know by the looks of it it's gone green this gate doesn't get a lot of a uh, lot of use this one <laughs> lets the postman through and that's about it uh, matching repousse on that leaf and again, you know, this one's on traditional journals, goes into a, a bearing at the bottom, down in the ground there. And I think this one is actually mounted on a steel frame, so we do occasionally give it a jet wash and take that out to shows as well. So there's quite a few different gates uh, and there's lots of different things to consider. The main one is functionality, controlling things like access, as I said, um, and preventing, you know, people you don't want getting through or your animals getting out. Uh, this gate on the yard, obviously stops the uh, gate is primarily there to stop the cows getting out or when the goats jump over the cattle grid it prevents the goats getting out uh, which happened on Sunday and I got in trouble um, uh, the other main one with the gates is obviously safety you don't want too many sharp edges anything like that uh, anywhere you're going to get trapped either um, so at the moment this gate has what you can see is steel box section posts those are actually going to get bricked in uh, so that's the core for the brick pillars that are going to go there and if I get round to it I might actually forge a pair of dragon sculptures uh, want to sit on each gate post wishful thinking I think that though because uh, I very much doubt we'll uh, ever get round to doing it but that's the plan we're gonna get round to it eventually I'm gonna get some time if I ever get time uh, and make some nice little dragons I saw some cool ones that have been done in stone a few years ago and I thought well I make some nice dragons and that'd be a nice way of uh, finishing it off so, uh, so it's nearly feeding time the goats and cows are going to want some grub so uh, yeah that's pretty much it for, for gates so I've shown you a few of the different gates we've got floating around the workshop uh, and out on the farmyard the you know it doesn't matter what size or style of gate you're going for the three main points are functionality obviously aesthetic design and safety when it comes to them whether you're doing huge automated gates working in solid bronze or stainless steel doesn't really matter as so long as it functions it you know controls the access be it vehicles or animals or whatever you're trying to keep in um, and that you're not going to kill someone in the process then you, you pretty much nailed it obviously you've got to worry about things like levels um, you know what you're attaching the gate to all sorts of different bits and pieces uh, the oak tree gate that I've showed in a couple of my previous blogs we're hoping to go out and fit that this week so next week what I might do if the clients happy with me filming it on site is uh, talk about some of the points uh, to do with gate uh, fitting and safety and the functionality out on site as well so you guys can get a bit of a look at that in depth um, hope you guys found this interesting and we shall see you next time at Phoenix Forge cheers guys